Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're here again on another edition of Wow's Alive with our host, Ned Dennison. Ned? Hello, everybody. I'm an epic marathon swimmer. I'm the chairman of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame, and I'm one of those people lucky enough to have swum in Boston Light. Um, our next guest is the uh, one of the organizers of the Boston Light Swim, but we're not going to let her talk about that at all. I'm going to introduce Elaine Howley and ask her to talk a little bit about her swimming career, both marathon and ice, and then we're going to jump into her journalism career. Elaine, over to you. All right. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's finally sunny here in Boston, which is a uh, uh, welcome uh, relief after all the rain we've had. But uh, yeah, so I, uh, I'm the race director of the Boston Light Swim. Uh, I have also been a, a marathon swimmer since 2006, I think was the first time I swam the Boston Light, which made me my uh, a marathon swimmer as an eight mile long race that is uh, gets you on the boards as a marathoner. Um, from there, I progress into longer and longer swims, and to date, I have done the Triple Crown. Uh, I've also done the Triple Crown of Monster Swims, <laughs> which is uh, the uh, Lake Memphis, Magog, uh, Lake Tahoe, and Loch Ness. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, I was also the first person to swim the length of Lake Pondere in northern Idaho, which is a 32-mile swim. Um, I've also done a little bit of ice and winter swimming. Um, I did an ice mile in Boston Harbor in 2012, uh, and I also competed at the um, World Ice Swimming Championship in uh, 2017 in Berghausen, Germany, which was great fun. Um, and I'm, uh, I go up every year to the Winter Swimming Festival in uh, Vermont, uh, put on by Phil White. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my swimming in a nutshell. Um, before you go on from swimming, your most memorable swim or event um, in, in all of these swimming adventures of yours? Most memorable? Uh, probably Ponderé. That's, that's a swim that I'll always treasure. Um, we had so much good local support and people really got excited by the idea that somebody was finally going to swim the length of this lake. Um, and so the whole, the whole uh, Sandpoint area, people from all over Bonner, Bonner County came out to to cheer me in at the finish and it was just really phenomenal like and I, I, there's no way I could have done it without that sort of uh, local support so it was it was really yeah cherished memory there <laughs> and when you got out of the swim was it a normal place or was one of those dry counties that they have some places in America that don't serve <laughs> alcohol <laughs> no, mercifully, they have their own brewery right there. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you, so Elaine swam to the brewery. Oh, okay. Basically, I yeah, yeah. And there's one of my favorite photos ever taken of me is the next day at the brewery, you know, me with a giant pint glass that has a map of Idaho on it. You know, it's just, yeah, yeah. It was uh, good beer up there, actually. And, and then now talk, talk to us about your journalist career um, and, and, you know, you've done some absolutely fascinating stories on, on open water swimming and marathon. Um, give us a bit of a background of how long you've been doing this and then start talking about some of the high points. Yeah. So, um, I started, um, I've, I've, I didn't realize that writing was a skill. Um, I didn't realize that I had any talent in that department until, um, I got out into the working world, like all through um, school and college and stuff. I just thought everybody could write, you know, and then I got out into the worker world and I started getting emails and I realized, oh my God, no people, there's, there's actually just, uh, you know, a gradations of skill here. And so um, I started to get really interested in the idea of becoming a writer. Um, and so I enrolled, I went to Emerson for my master's degree. Emerson College here in Boston has an excellent writing program. So I went there and took some journalism classes and uh, feature writing and nonfiction writing classes and uh, ended up getting a job um, writing uh, for a, it was a consulting firm that had a publishing arm and they served architects and engineers. And I knew absolutely nothing about architecture or engineering uh, but the guy who hired me, who's still a good friend, uh, could see from my application that I could write. And so he said, you know, we can teach you the, the, the information you need. That's no problem. You'll get that, but you've got the basic skills. So um, I started working there and, um, you know, kind of, I think, I think that... Uh, 
part of part of what makes me me is that I'm always looking for another challenge and I always want something else to do and I like to not have downtime uh, just because I feel like there's a lot to accomplish every day so um, I started uh, I was swimming at the time and I, I would get this magazine in the mail from uh, US Master Swimming, their, their swimmer magazine. Um, and I thought, gosh, you know, it'd be kind of cool if maybe I could write for them someday, you know, and couldn't quite figure out how to crack that nut initially. But then um, by ch I, I was working, uh, I was volunteering, I should say, as the um, editor, the newsletter editor for uh, New England Masters for our local club newsletter. And one day I was in the locker room and one of my fellow swimmers came in with a comic strip that she had clipped out of the newspaper. And it was all about master swimming. And she was like, I don't know who this guy is or what the story is behind this, but this is really interesting. So I said, well, yeah, that's really interesting. How often do you see master swimming in the funny papers? Like not, not that often. So um, I dug into it. I sent a couple of emails. And before you know it, I had uh, an interview set up with Jeff Millett, uh, who is the artist who draws Fraz, which is a syndicated comic strip in hundreds of papers across the country. Um, and he was incredibly nice. And at the end of the interview, which was intended to just be for our local newsletter, he's in Michigan, though. It was going to be kind of a, a tough tough to fit it into our like what why am i covering this guy who's in michigan if i'm reading for the new England masters newsletter so on a whim i sent it to you know once i finished the story i sent it on to the editor of swimmer magazine and i said you know i don't know if you use freelancers or not but you know i have this story that i can't really use in my my piece so if you'd like it you know maybe we could work something out and he responded back almost immediately and said, oh, we don't, we use our own stable of writers. Thank you, but no thank you. And I thought, okay, well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Oh, well. And I go back to what I'm doing. A day later, I get another email back from him. And then he says, actually, I was a little hasty. I sat down and read your piece. It's very good. We would like to use it. We need to make some edits to it, but this is good. And that was how I became um, a regular contributor to uh, Swimmer Magazine. Um, it was really just a case of, uh, the answer is always no if you don't ask. So that has been kind of my guiding philosophy ever since. And uh, I think it must have been probably about 2011. So, so that was in 2009 when that happened. And I, so I got some, some assignments from Swimmer and started to sort of um, get my feet wet in, in uh, freelance journalism. Uh, and then in 2011, uh, Outdoor Swimmer launched, and um, I was all over that. I wanted to be part of that uh, publication in, a, in the worst way. Um, and again, I just sent an email and I said, "Hey, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to work with you guys. How can I help?" And so that has since evolved into my producing a uh, feature-length history piece for each issue. Um, and it's been some of the most rewarding work I've gotten to do. Uh, I've gotten to learn so much about the history of marathon swimming, uh, which is really rich. And there are so many fabulous characters that populate this universe. I mean, just, just really interesting people who've done off the wall things that nobody thought were possible. And so um, it's been a real joy to be able to, to dig into that. And I'm really grateful that Outdoor Swimmer continues to let me <laughs> waffle on about the history of marathon swimming. I can't hear you, Ned. I can see you're talking, but I can't hear you. Sorry about that. As interesting as some of your stuff has been for Outdoor Swimmer, uh, Steve did an interview yesterday with Dr. Uh, Dr. David Smith, who, you know, you know, to talk about interesting, he's absolutely off the scale. But you should, you'll, you'll, when, you, when you listen to that interview, I'm sure you'll be on to him. Yeah. Uh, talk, talk to us about the most fascinating characters you've 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 written about but also how you've gone about the research yeah um so like when when you ask me like what what's interesting one of the first um stories that pops into my head is florence chadwick um and i really admire what she did because um you know in the 1950s she was twice divorced and living at home and working in her parents restaurant and kind of mm, not real thrilled with her situation and 
she had sort of taken an I uh, uh, taken this idea into her her head that maybe someday she could swim the channel but she didn't have the funding to do it and so she answered an advertisement in the newspaper to go become a secretary for standard oil in saudi arabia so you know in the 1950s i mean saudi arabia didn't even give women the right to drive until 2018 i mean like it's just it's just madness to me that she would just pack her bags off to saudi arabia for two years all in pursuit of this dream that she really wanted to make reality. And uh, once she was there, I mean, as if it weren't, you know, impressive enough to do that, she, she trained while she was there. And so the story is that she would bribe a couple of her male coworkers, because of course she couldn't drive herself, um, to take her down to the Gulf every day for training sessions. And she would bribe them in beer because, you know, in a, in a, in a Muslim country, it's often difficult to obtain alcohol. Um, <laughs> so she was paying these guys in beer and they would just sit there on the dock. And sometimes she'd be tethered to the dock and just swimming in place. Other times she would like go back and forth a little bit, but they would kind of hang out on the beach and watch and make sure she was okay. And then take her back and stuff. And um, when she finished her contract after two years, she just, she got on a steamer and the steamer had a, a pulled into port in Wisconsin to refuel and she got off and didn't get back on. Um, and she tried to get into the daily mail race, uh, but nobody had ever heard of her. And so they denied her entry. And she said, well, okay then. So she went down to the docks and she found a fisherman to take her. And uh, it just, you know, there's just so much, you know, chutzpah to all of that that just really, uh, I just really admire that. Like, I, I don't think that I would have the wherewithal to go through at that level. Um, but she did, and she, she got it done, and she ended up um, breaking Edley's record, and she scooped the Daily Mail on their race, because um, she swam a few days before their race, and, and the newspapers were out of their minds over this beautiful woman who just came out of nowhere and did the impossible all by herself, you know, it was, it was really good, and then she went on to become, uh, if you adjust for inflation, she went on to become uh, the, the highest paid female athlete of the 20th century, so you know, because she had all kinds of endorsements and speaking engagements and she was a fixture on TV and stuff. And you know, I just, I find that really fascinating. And um, just, I, I just, it's just so, to kind of get into the mind of somebody like that, when you do the research for this stuff, you sort of get to know the subject a little bit, like, a, like from a, you're, you're a little bit removed because you're having to make inferences based on, you know, what documents are available. But there's a, there's a certain kind of getting to know her. And it's like, man, I would have liked to hang out with her. Uh, one of the things that uh, I do when I do research, I don't know if you're the same, is I, I look at what they earned. And I, I looked the other day, and it was a swimmer who, who earned $30,000 in his best year or something. And you put it into the, the internet calculator, yeah. and you went, that's $400,000 yeah. equivalent in money today. So some yeah. of those early swimmers yeah. were making a lot of money. Yeah, fortunes, small fortunes. And so that, you know, it, it, when you think about it that way, it's no wonder that Wrigley had a hundred and some people enter the water that day in pursuit of the $25,000 prize. That was worth like a million dollars back then. I mean, yeah. I, I know a lot of yahoos who would give that a go too. <laughs> you know, so it's really interesting. And it, it's interesting how, like in that perspective, how uh, marathon swimming, especially its entertainment value, has been devalued over the years. Like, you used to be able to get money for it. And now you've got somebody like Sarah Thomas who goes off and bangs out this incredible swim and is sitting on the beach with a packet of M&Ms, like, in a death grip, and she can't get a sponsorship for M&Ms. Like, it just, the mind boggles. I presume you read about Sarah Thomas in the paper. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. And, and what I was reading was the first hand, hand accounts I wrote. <laughs> So you were on uh, you were on two of her big swims. You were, mm -hmm. if, if I remember right, Lake Champlain and the uh, in the four way channel. Tell mm -hmm. us about Lake Champlain first. So I was one of the two official observers on that one. I alternated with Evan Morrison, uh, and that was that was pretty epic. <laughs> um, it, we had every kind of weather you could imagine. Uh, we had sunny and calm. We had windy. And, you know, at one point I got woken up at like three in the morning. It was, I was off my shift and I was down below taking a nap. And I got woken because I got like tossed out of the bunk because the waves had gotten so big. Champlain is so big and you get this big volume of air that comes down out of Canada that it can get really gnarly there wind-wise sometimes. And 
you know, we had just been out there long enough. We'd been through all of these cycles of weather that you can have over the course of, you know, 67 hours. And so we hit the, the rough spot and that was, um, luckily it was a tailwind for Sarah. Uh, the boats really struggled to hang with her, but she was kind of actually surfing down waves behind her. So, um, yeah, it was, it was, a it was a heck of a journey. I mean, just, just really fascinating. We had a good crew. Um, everything went pretty much like clockwork on Champlain. And, um, you know, despite those variable weather conditions, she, you know, she just, she would just plowed right through it. I mean, there was never a doubt. So just for the, for the viewers who might not be aware, Lake Champlain, uh, is north of New York city, runs up towards Montreal, Canada, a couple of hundred miles long and, and it's widest stretch. It's about 12 miles wide but it's a, it's a big freshwater lake. Mm -hmm. um, and Sarah swam 50 point something miles up one way, turned around and came 50 something miles back the other way. So yeah. current, current neutral in, in, our, in our language. Right. Um, then um, Sarah was on with us a, a little while ago. She had her, uh, her bout with cancer. She went to the Cook Strait and uh, off, to, off to Dover. So not your first time in Dover, but uh, mm -hmm. your first time... Uh, as a war correspondent, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um, yeah, like, so that was, um, I swam the channel in 2009. I went back to Dover in 2014 to crew Bill Ship, who's a friend who lives down in Maryland. Uh, and then so Sarah asked, she was looking for a very specific type of crew. She needed people who could be there in Dover for, three weeks while we waited for her weather window um, and who had experience and knew her and had been involved in other swims of this sort of magnitude. And so that's a, all of a sudden you're getting a very small pool of people who might become available. And um, because I'm a freelancer, um, I can, I could work from the moon if I could get cell signals. So, you know, it didn't matter whether I was in Massachusetts. It didn't matter if I was sitting in Dover, I could, I could continue to work. So, so I was on board for the whole three weeks. Her mom, <laughs> was on board for the whole three weeks because her mom's a teacher and it was summertime so she was she was able to get the time uh we had to get creative with um carl and craig because each one of them had limited amounts of vacation time from work but you know it worked out in the end and yeah i mean her swim um there was a lot of um a lot of concern going into it uh just because she had been through such a difficult physical um battle prior to uh, the swim and she you know wasn't certain whether she'd had enough time to kind of get back on the horse and you know train and so forth but um, you know she just she, she, yet again in, the, in Sarah Thomas fashion she just focused on the the what was in front of her and got it done I mean it was it was pretty amazing um, and uh, we didn't realize I think I think we were a little naive going in just what a big story this was going to be um, and so we didn't really have like a, a press strategy or a plan or anything like that because it's marathon swimming and nobody cares. So why what, would we have a what, plan? What, what part of the four-way not a big story didn't you know? <laughs> well, I, like, I don't think we realized just how, how many uh, news outlets were going to uh, you know, jump on this press release. So we're, we're on the boat and uh, one of the observers, um, Suzanne Martin, a lovely, lovely woman and absolutely the right person for the job that day because not only was she an excellent observer of the swim, but she also is a documentary maker and a, um, uh, a former journalist herself. So she understands the, the British uh, uh, news ecosystem and what we needed to do to, you know, get, get Sarah a little bit of press. So she helped me put together a press release and we got it out and then the phones started ringing and ringing and ringing and I'm doing interviews from the boat, you know, with, I'm talking to People Magazine and I'm like, I'm really sorry, Phil, I've got to go. I've got to jump in the water and swim with Sarah because it's my hour now. So she'll kill me if I'm not there on time. So talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> you know, and, and it was just the, the, um, the, the outpouring of interest and support at that moment was, it was really amazing, but it was a bit like drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, there were just so many requests and 
uh, the finish of her swim was pretty epic because we just, we didn't know where she was going to land. That last leg, the tide didn't do what it was forecast to do. And so she was out there for about five hours longer than anticipated. And, you know, is she going to land at Shaky Beach? Is she going to land at St. Margaret's Bay? You know, there was a lot of this back and forth trying to figure it out. And, you know, all these um, press people wanted to be at the, the, the finish. And, and I'm trying to coordinate with John Washer, who's trying to make a documentary about the swim. And I'm trying to keep him posted. And I'm like, oh, John, I, I don't know. We just don't know. And he's like, how can you not know you're on the boat? <laughs> we just don't know. It's not up to us. It's up to the water right now. Like, Welcome to the sport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he, I think he made four runs back and forth between St. Margaret's and Shaky Beach before we said, no, it's gonna be shaky and it's gonna be iffy. If cause she was actually headed straight for the ferry terminal and Eddie kind of forced her to make a hard, that was that last jog was to kind of get her out of the danger zone at the ferry terminal and along that seawall into shaky beach. And it was, it was just like, oh my God, by the time we were done, it was like, oh my God. <laughs> Wow. Um, so yeah, it was, it was pretty amazing. Um, so were cool. You, were you, were you responsible? I mean, were you really responsible for making sure the bag of M&Ms got there? Was that your role on the boat? Uh, I had many, many roles on the boat. I was trying to get some film footage for John's uh, film. I was uh, trying to uh, document things for Outdoor Swimmer. You know, they, they gave me the keys to the social media castle. So I was posting live from the boat. Mm -hmm. um, I was also crewing her. Um, I was her Sherpa at the turns. So on each turn I would get in and I had a little backpack, you know, one of my little Boston light backpacks. I put oatmeal and warm water and stuff in it and then I and lanolin the lanolin was really important don't forget that and so I'd uh get into the little dinghy and and Mike would bring me in to shore and then I'd hop out and I had to wear fins because Sarah's so fast I had to wear fins to keep up with her and of course I'm swimming with a backpack full of food too so you know swim it all awkwardly at the turn and then try really hard not to touch her you know don't touch her <laughs> but hand her stuff and what do you feel like having and you know we would have these very uh, momentous conversations at each one of these turns and yeah, for, some so. of our, for, for some of our viewers um, who are used to uh, Vaseline, Vaseline is fine. It comes off after a while. Lanolin is made from uh, sheep wool, sheep fat, and it doesn't come off anytime. <laughs> so it stays it's on. So and it's, it's, it's a lubricant for under the arms and around the neck um, and right. the groin for chafing. Um, Elaine, the, the thing that just uh, I think I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone is uh, thousands of marathon swimmers were wincing at a couple of the turns where you're going, hang on a minute. She's got this entire crew and pilots and everything, and they can't get her a nice, warm, sandy beach to nope. turn on where she can stand for two minutes. They got her a wall where she has to tread water mm -hmm. um, at the turn. Um, uh -huh. for, the, for the viewers, uh, you're allowed a certain number of minutes to, to come out on the warm, sandy beach, bask in the sun, reapply your grease. Yeah. And here comes Elaine swimming in and Sarah's uh, treading water by a jagged bit of rock wall. And it was not just one turn that you missed. All of them. All of them. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to blame Sarah for most of that. It's because she was so fast. She landed on the cap, right on the cap twice. Like, it's hard to do that once. She did it twice at the end of a three-way. I mean, like, it just, again, the mind boggles. Like, how? Um, and then the seawall at Shaky, that was because it was good weather and the entire fleet came out and it just wasn't safe to try and thread through all of those other boats. So Eddie made the wa very wise decision to land her at the seawall, but oh my God, I've never heard such anguish. Sarah was really looking forward to getting out of the water for just a second, you know, and, and it's not like getting out on the shingle beach there at um, Samfire Ho is any any great thing. I mean, it hurts. Those those rocks are not pleasant to stand on, especially when you've been in the water for 24 hours and are just all puffy and stuff. But she was really ready to just have a second to feel gravity again. And no, no, and she just, oh, she turns to me and she's like, where's the beach? And I said, this, I'm sorry, this is all I've got for you. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm sorry, but the, I'm sure the sorry worked the one time, but you, you pulled it off a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For, for the, she for still the, talks to me. This is good. <laughs> for, the, for the viewers, uh, Sarah was uh, very complimentary about her pilot, who's the experienced Eddie Spelling out of He's Dover. Wonderful. 
And the other thing that uh, Elaine just mentioned was the cap. And the, the English Channel is a, is a narrow bit of water, lots of uh, boat traffic, ferries, uh, tankers. I think the busiest stretch of water in the world is built at. And uh, on the French side, there's a, there's a promontory that comes out, a bit of land. And for anybody who's ever had a garden hose and you put your finger at the end of the garden hose and squeeze it a little bit, the water goes out faster. And that's what happens in the English Channel. The water goes faster on this little point of land Every channel swimmer's dream is to land there because it's the shortest swim. But uh, when the tides are running at that cap, you know, nobody can swim there. Um, it's, right. it's just absolutely fierce. And, and, and Sarah uh, hit it twice. Uh, and, um, That's... Just, just, uh, just an incredible swim. Your, uh, your piece in Outdoor Swimmer was, was fabulous. Okay. Uh, did you also have a similar piece for other media outlets? Um, I did a more newsy style piece for USMS for their website about it because it became such big news, even though Sarah's not a member, they, they, they covered it. Um, i trying to think who else. Uh, you know, the funny thing was is that um, it became such a big story that um, most media places kept it in-house. You know, they put their... Uh, even though I had pitched several outlets, um, I got turned down as either being too close to the story, which, you know, I get that from, from a journalism standpoint. Yeah, that, that makes sense. But there were a couple of outlets that were just like, no, it's too big a story. We've got to put our own people on it. So, yeah, so Outdoor Swimmer was it for in terms of like the big piece that came out of that. But we are still working on the film and that should hopefully be out later this year. Okay. So we talked about Florence. We've talked about Sarah. Let's go back in time, mm -hmm. uh, way back in uh, the earlier days. Uh, give us an interesting character. And, and, and again, the, the research you had to do to, mm. to, to do the story back in the days when, uh, you know, it was, it was old time newspapers and you'd be lucky to get some microfilm. Yeah, yeah. So um, the digital age has made that a lot easier for me. Um, I have a, a one of the platinum level newspaper.com <laughs> accounts, so I can access um, a lot of digitized archives that go way back. Um, you know, I also have a uh, growing library of um, uh, books that, you know, I find on resellers online and stuff. And um, I recently picked up a really, I don't think I have it to show you, I think it's in the other room, but um, a really interesting book about um, African diaspora and swimmers uh, from Africa back in the day, like back in, you know, prior to the slave trade and stuff, which I'm really interested to dig into. That this is Dr. Like. Kevin's book? I think it, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I picked up a copy of that and I can't wait to dive into it. Um, uh, as far as like old timey, interesting stories, um, yeah, so I think um, I just love the the story of uh, Wrigley's Marathon, uh, the 1927 Catalina race. Um, there's just so much interesting there. There's some. It, give every, uh, give, Ellen, give everybody the background of why Wrigley, why Catalina, yeah. set the stage for them. So in 1926, Gertrude Ederly became the first woman to swim the English Channel, and and sort of didn't just swim it, but she destroyed the men's record and really proved that marathon swimming is is a sport that's as much for women, if not more so than for men. Um, she was, you know, catapulted to, to superstardom internationally overnight, like to the point where like she and her family had to kind of run away to Germany to go hide for a few days to let some of the, the, the media frenzy die down. Um, but as a result of that, there was so much press and such interest in this that um, William Wrigley Jr., who was, um, I think, uh, uh, it was a while ago since I wrote it, so I might be a little rusty on some of the details here, but I believe he was um, started out as like a newspaper boy in New York City. Um, and he ended up coming into his dad's business, which was totally unrelated to chewing gum. I think it was, it was baking powder that they made originally. Um, and what they found was that um, they would, uh, as a, he was, he was kind of like a, a pro at marketing before marketing was a thing. Um, really savvy in making sales. And I guess that all harkens back to his time as being a newspaper boy uh, on the streets of New York City. Um, 
so he hit on the idea of putting in a stick of gum into every package of baking soda or baking powder, whatever it was they were selling. Um, and, and it soon became clear that people were buying it for the gum, not for the powder itself. And so like overnight, he decided to change the company. Instead of making that, we're going to make this gum. So it became Wrigley's Chewing Gum Company. And he became incredibly wealthy, so wealthy that he was able to buy a resort Actually, I think he might have owned the whole island at one point of Catalina off the coast of Southern California. And um, he was trying to drum up business in the off season uh, to, to, to you know, make more money off this lump of land he has. And so he saw all this media attention going on with Ederly and decided that he wanted to stage some sort of marathon swimming extravaganza to grab a lot of international attention. So he decided to stage this uh, race across the Catalina Channel. He he, and it was savvy. I mean, it's not dissimilar from the English Channel. It's a little shorter. The weather tends to be a little better. The water's usually a little warmer. But, you know, it ticks a lot of the boxes. It's this big stretch of scary water. And at that point, it hadn't been done yet. So nobody was even really sure whether it was doable. Um, so he puts up this crazy purse, $25,000 first prize purse. Uh, there were a couple of other monetary prizes as well. So all total, he was putting up $40,000 worth of prize money, which back then was millions of dollars worth, um, and, and puts out an open call for entries. Um, he gets like 400 people who enroll, um, and they're going to swim in Jan January of 1927. Now, Ederly declined his ed invitation, but that was okay, because he was off to the races with this, you know, anyway, because there was all, so much interest in, in marathon swimming at that point that any big race like that was going to get attention. So um, <laughs> the, I think the piece that I love the most about this story is that 17-year-old, um, uh, you know, man from... Um, uh, Canada sees the notice and says, hey, I can do that. This, this kid named George Young says, I can do that. So uh, he takes his last $135 and buys a motorbike with a sidecar and he asks his buddy to go with him. And so the two of them hop in the, the motorbike and, and start heading. They're going to drive from somewhere in Eastern Canada across to California. And it's just, you know, he had no money. So there's like this, this element of, you know, last ditch desperation as a 17 year old kind of thing. The bike breaks down in Arkansas. And so they end up hitching a ride with this newlywed couple. It's just crazy. It's like, it's like something out of a Jack Kerouac novel. So they end up in California. Um, at this point, there's uh, most of the field has dropped out. They're down to about a hundred swimmers. Uh, they launch. It's bitterly cold because it's January. I mean, it's California, but it's cold out there in January. Uh, and so they swim and George is the only one who finishes. He somehow hangs in there. And again, it was a case of an unknown swimmer. Nobody saw him coming. Uh, the papers, all the pre-press hype was focused on established swimmers and nobody paid any attention to George Young. But he gets it done. And so he's, he's granted this $25,000 prize. So he goes from spending his last 135 bucks on a motorcycle that breaks down en route, ends up with $25,000 and movie offers out the wazoo because, you know, LA is right there. So all the Hollywood moguls come out and try and offer him. So, but George is 17 and he doesn't know what he's doing. And he got kind of bamboozled by a bad manager and, you know, a lot of these um, offers dried up before they even managed to get a contract behind them. And so it's, it's just, it, it, it's a fascinating story. It's like rags to riches to rags again, because he ended up losing all of the money in the end. And he goes back to Canada and ended up as a park ranger, um, just lived a very quiet, normal life. And, and it just, just a fascinating episode in, you know, I don't know. Is it daredevilism? Is it, um, you know, living life to the fullest? I don't know what world. you call it. Yeah. So that that forty thousand um, dollars is about six hundred thousand U.S. dollars today. <laughs> so that's a lot of money. That's I've got two two last things, Elaine. The first yeah. thing is is just just to remind you that you were four hours faster across the Catalina Channel than George. It could have been you. 
<laughs> and, and now that you've smiled, I'm going to ask you to to, to talk a little bit about um, about Mindy. Uh, Mindy, yeah. So uh, I lost a friend this week. Um, her name is Mindy Bowens. She was a beautiful human being from New Jersey, um, a, a lovely swimmer. Um, and she had a real rough go of it over the last year and a half. Um, uh, yeah, and it, it was, it, this is, it's hard, it's sad. Um, I'm hopeful that she's at peace now because she couldn't seem to catch a break for uh, a while there. Uh, she had some health issues. So um, yeah, we're, we're gonna miss her. She was a, also a fixture at the winter games and she would put her mermaid tail on and sit on the side of the ice pool in her little mermaid outfit. And uh, it was just, you know, she definitely was a force and she will be missed. I never met the woman, but I, I was on social media with a thousand Mindy posts that came over the mm -hmm. last few years. And, and we've been blessed in the sport that often people who are suffering the worst health are the happiest people to be around. They, they sure are. Yeah. So we're, we're sorry for your loss. And thank you. Um, thank you very much for your time today. Yeah. And just think you were four hours faster than Mr. Young across the county. Yeah, hey. It could have been you. Could have been you. Check me. the post. That might be 600,000. It just arrived through the mail. <laughs> I dare to dream. Take care, Elaine. Thank you Bye. very much. Bye, Ned. Thanks. Bye.